Good morning, Central Church, wherever you are. It is a good and glorious day to be together in worship. I'm going to invite you for the next hour to find a space to ground yourself. Maybe you're standing, maybe you're sitting. I don't know if you're on a porch or a couch or here in a pew. But for the next hour, I invite you to be fully present, to worship, to song, to prayer, to the presence of God who is with us all no matter where we are. If you are here this morning and those of you who are out there somewhere watching, you are welcome to be here on Sunday mornings to be in person, to listen to the music live, um, and to be here and interact with people, even at a distance. We welcome you to be here. But if you are here, um, you'll need to sign the friendship pad thoroughly, not just your name, but with contact information as well. This is how we're doing contact tracing if we need it in the future. And you will need to leave your masks on. We still are in this less formal live stream format. We're still taking every possible precaution to keep people safe. We're six feet apart. And except for us here, folks are wearing masks. Pastor Laurel is here in person. Tyler and Maggie Wolford are moderating and bringing forth comments from the live stream. And you are invited to add your thoughts and prayers as we go along as well. If you do want to add comments to the live stream, you need to be logged in through a YouTube account to do so. It's free, it's easy, uh, but that's how you put comments on the chat. Sean Stafford and Carrie and Danielle Spencer and Sarah Hungerford are offering their gifts of music today. We have bells today, y'all. It's wonderful. And that incredible tech team is back there making it all happen. We have Chris and Ben and Nate and Bob back in the back. Um, we have ushers and we have guests. It is wonderful to be in worship together. We are the church. We're not confined to a building. We are deployed into a hundred or so house churches all over the world, imagine that. Until we can all be present together again, we lift our prayers and our worship from the spot we're at. Let us begin this worship this morning with prayer. Holy One, sometimes we don't know where to turn. Life gets complicated. The decisions pile up. Everywhere we look these days seems to be a crisis. We are tired, we are worried, we are worn out. Yet here we are in worship, risking our hearts and lives to seek your grace. And so we ask, help us to let go and to open up. Fill us so full of your spirit that there's no room left for fear or worry. Overflow your love into us that we may have more than enough to share with those around us. We ask it because we trust in you in all our ways through all our days. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start our worship together with bells.
Good morning, friends. It's a blessing to be here with all of you in worship today. I hope you don't mind I snuck in to take a little picture of the family bell choir because it made me really happy. I didn't get super close to anybody. As I stood there, I was like, oh, I should be wearing a mask right now. But I was, I was plenty of space. I was plenty of space away, so I was taking all of the precautions. It's beautiful when a family can come together with something that's such a gift like music. We're so glad to have you here this morning and all the time. For this morning's mental health moment, I wanted to talk mostly to parents, grandparents, caregivers, people with children in their lives. The um, governor came through with school information and school districts are coming through with uh, this as well. That there is no right answer. That what I would advise as we walk into this unknown space together is that we extend grace. Grace to our sisters and brothers who make different choices than we do. Whether they decide to go all online or decide to send their kids to school, everyone is struggling with what, what is a life and death choice. Trying to figure out what the best fit is for their family. So I wanted to take a minute to normalize that struggle. To know that every family is having that struggle. Every family who did not already homeschool before COVID is dealing with that. And so I feel like the best way we can be a family of faith is to extend grace and love no matter what that choice is. Because there, there are parents who are working, there are parents who are not working, there are caregivers who are struggling to figure out how to make this work, how to make sure their kids get what they need developmentally and academically and just knowing that everyone's going to be a year behind next year. It's just kind of how it's going to be. And so breathe in God's grace for yourself. Breathe in God's grace for families around you. Social media makes that so hard. But just pause for a moment and be grounded in the fact that you know you are making the best decision you can with the information you have, no matter what that decision may be. And if you ever need some spiritual guidance or support, we're always here. You can call the church office. You can email one of us. You are not alone in this misadventure. That you have family and friends that you can turn to no matter what. That's what community is. Amen? For our children's moment this morning, I wanted to talk a little bit about the virtual vacation Bible school that we've been going through. Um, next week, we will be showing you a video to give you a little bit of taste. Next week's going to be, we're going to be entering into our last week, so I'll make sure that we get a chance to see some of the songs, some of the activities. But every week, we talk about having compassion. Compassion for each other, compassion for the world. This week it was compassion for ourselves. So it fits kind of well into my, into my mental health moment. Like having compassion for yourself even when you have to make a hard decision. Well, one of the things that we got to do was take time creating something that brings you joy. Um, Sarah, who is the Faith Formation Coordinator, is the best crocheter I have ever seen making things from owls to unicorns to shawls to things that I can't even comprehend. Sewing does not bring me joy. I can sew straight lines, but I know lots of people who make beautiful quilts. One of the things that she said on Facebook made me think of how we are created to be creative. And so I want to encourage you this week as the kids just learn to have compassion for themselves by doing things they enjoy, to take some time and do something that brings you joy. If you'd be willing to share it in the comments of what you do that brings you joy. I know that when my mom is not recovering from a knee replacement, she loves to make cards. She's doing very well, by the way. Um, those cards will be coming out in maybe a couple more weeks. And I know that I love, um, I do like to crochet. I am by no means Sarah. 
but I love to paint, and I go to painting class every week, and I love to create things. My husband just built <laughs> a life-size, well, maybe not life-size, it feels life-size to me, a giant dragon in our front uh, gardens. We realized we could not keep plants alive, so he took recycled tires, and he made a dragon. And so maybe someday I'll show you all a picture of this dragon. But it's just about taking time to create things that bring you joy and how that'll serve to bolster your spirits, but it also serve to be who God created you to be. God created us to be creative. And so one of the best ways to have compassion for yourself is to give yourself permission to create. So I look forward to hearing what you do and what you can create over the next week. Thank you. Our scripture this morning continues the stories of Jesus. This one picks up right after the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew's Gospel. I'm reading from um, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase called The Message, as I do because I think the language is fresh and real for us today. So from the Gospel attributed to Matthew, chapter 14. As soon as the meal was finished, the meal, it sounds like they got up from a table. This is feeding 5,000 people. He insisted, Jesus insisted, that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the people. With the crowd dispersed, he climbed the mountain so he could be by himself and pray. And he stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water and they were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, he said, it's me, don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, if it's really you, call me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come on, come on ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves, churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and he started to sink. And he cried out, Master, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed Peter's hand, and then he said, Faint heart, faint heart, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat, and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having seen the whole thing, worshipped Jesus, saying, This is it. You are surely God's son. Well, this is relatable in 2020, isn't it? Doesn't it feel like we are barely afloat in tiny little boats against a great big storm these days? Each month brings new bad news, new crisis, new challenges, new pain. You know, somewhere in the last few months, I lost track of the murder hornets. They were supposed to be happening. What happened to the murder hornets? But now it's hurricane season, so I can't worry about the murder hornets anymore. There's, there's more wind coming off the Sahara that can become potential hurricanes that combined with a pandemic and what's shaping up to be a brutal political season ahead, it looks like the perfect storm. Do you ever see that? That's a sad and terrible movie. George Clooney going down. Anyway, horrible. Where is God in all of that? In storms like that? Where is faith in all of that? There's a great old Charles Tindley hymn. It's number 512 in the hymnal. I am not, I'm going to spare you, I am not going to sing it, but Sean's going to play it. Just a verse in the refrain or whatever you feel like.
When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. I love a good old Tindley hymn. There's five of them in our hymnal. Charles Tindley wrote his hymns about faith as he experienced it, a genuine leaning on Jesus in times of strength, but maybe more importantly, like this one, in times of storm and trouble. He began writing hymns, including one that became the civil rights anthem, We Shall Overcome. He's known as the father of gospel music, but we don't hear that much about him. You should know more about him. He was a Methodist. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Charles Tinley. He was an African-American Methodist pastor who educated himself, became a minister, and founded one of the largest Methodist congregations serving the African-American community on the east coast of the U.S. After he died, it was renamed Tindley Temple, and it still stands in southeast Philadelphia. Tindley's father was a slave, and his mother was free, and after the Civil War, he moved to Philadelphia where he found a job, and with his wife Daisy, he attended a Methodist Episcopal church. He later became the janitor of that church, a job that had no salary. He was never able to go to school. But he learned independently and by asking people to help him and tutor him. He enlisted the help of a Philadelphia synagogue to learn Hebrew. And he learned Greek by taking a correspondence course through Boston Theological School. And without any degree, Tindley was qualified for ordination in the Methodist Episcopal Church by examination with high-ranking scores. You could do that once upon a time. He was ordained as a deacon in the Delaware Conference in 1887 and as an elder in 1889, and later in 1900, he became the presiding elder, what we now know as a DS, of the Wilmington District in Delaware. Then he went to become the pastor of this same church where he'd been a janitor. Under his leadership, the church grew from 130 people, and that was the number when he arrived, to become a multiracial congregation of 10,000. We think megachurches just happened in the 80s and 90s. He was acquainted with politicians and business leaders in Philadelphia, including John Wanamaker. He worked with business leaders to assist his members in finding jobs. He also encouraged members to start their own businesses and purchase homes. The church formed the East Calvary Building and Loan Association to offer mortgages. He also got donations from businessmen for food for the congregation's food ministry. He objected to social events that he considered degrading. In 1915, he and other leaders, including Russ, uh, Reverend Wesley Graham, led protesters in a march to the Forest Theater to protest against the showing of the birth of a nation, which, if you don't know about that, that led to the resurgence of Klan activity in the early 20th century. They were attacked by white people with clubs and sticks and bottles. Graham was hospitalized, but... Tindley's injuries were treated at home. 1915, y'all, it sounds like it could be yesterday, doesn't it? They say the more things change, the more they stay the same. I tell you that story to talk about this story, about Jesus and the storm and the water and the disciples. The scripture today gives us a story of Jesus that isn't told for a crowd. It's not told in a public moment. It's a story about him and his disciples and a moment of panic. He isn't preaching to the multitudes here about the kingdom of God. He's already done that. He isn't giving a lesson using a relatable story about life as they know it, like most of the parables and most of his teachings. This, instead, is a picture of a life moment. And often... Life moments can be messy and hard and completely unpredictable. Jesus is off somewhere by himself on the other side of the lake from the disciples. The storm is raging, the boat is small, it's the dark of the night, and the disciples are losing it. And Jesus walks into that, literally walk, walks into that, and insists that even in the storms, they need to have faith. 
when the storms of life are raging. And Peter, Peter miraculously for a moment gets it. He completely gets who Jesus is and what this faith is that Jesus has been talking about. This isn't an abstract idea of God or some fantasy about faith. This is what faith looks like when life gets real. When the storms are pounding and you can't see what's coming and you are surrounded by the night with no dawn in sight. Before this moment and certainly after this moment, Peter has and will have his doubts. But for this moment, after a storm, when the sea is still calming down, and with Jesus calling him forward, he gets it, that Jesus is about something so different that the world itself can change. Storms can still, people can walk on water. Peter discovers in this moment that faith can carry one where logic can't. Now, I don't think for a moment that the rest of the folks in the boat were quiet as this all was going down. Fear is something that grows a life of its own and makes itself sound reasonable and logical. We're certainly seeing that all around us today. Can you hear that? I can hear the disciples in the boat. Don't do it. Are you nuts? Don't step over the edge. You're going to drown. Are you crazy? That's the lake out there. You know the type. Maybe you are the type. I don't know. Some people call it caution. Others call it control. Peter chooses to step out of the boat when Jesus calls him. He's the only one of the 12 who takes the chance. Because suddenly, in a moment of complete clarity and complete trust, he understands the depth and width and fullness of faith. And when he falters and forgets to trust and begins to slip under the surface, Jesus catches him. Jesus doesn't give up on Peter. He doesn't say, you lost your faith, go ahead and drown. He doesn't give up on Peter, but hauls him back into the boat. He also doesn't give up on the other 11 who didn't even try. This whole story is a snapshot of the rough places in the journey of faith and the way Jesus doesn't give up on us when we are at our messiest. The other verses of that hymn are amazing. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I've done the best I can and friends misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my foes in war array undertake to stop my way, thou who savest Paul and Silas, stand by me. Faith takes us where logic can't. A friend of mine, Michael Piazza, says this, you may be right and Jesus may be wrong, but he's the one we've chosen to follow. Faith doesn't always work according to the rules of logic. Following Jesus means getting that worked into our deepest selves and living out of that reality. Faith takes us into a life deeper and sometimes stranger than we ever could imagine. The good news is, because there's always good news, even in the messiest, awfulest, no good, terrible, horrible, awfulest times, Jesus stands by us all the way, never giving up, waiting for us to lose our faint hearts, step out of the boat, and trust him. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.
I'm going to invite us into a time of prayer as we consider that scripture, that story, and the call of Christ to have faith. If you've got prayer requests that you'd like to put out on the live stream, please do. Um, and also, if, if you'd like to put out there where you've seen God at work this week, where has Jesus stood by you in this week, where have you come through a crisis this week by the grace of God, share that in the comments too if you wish. We have, um, we have flowers this morning. Uh, somebody's already commented on the flowers. They're beautiful. They are in honor of Barb Northrup, whose birthday was last week. There's purple flowers there. We celebrated Dick Sprague's 100th birthday this week. He had almost 100 cards come to his house. If you want to make it an even 100 and didn't get to send a card last week, go ahead. He won't mind. We also come to prayer with uh, folks on our prayer program in our minds and hearts. This week we pray particularly for Katie Bell, for Charlotte Connis, for Sue and Ed Driver, for Chuck and May Goodwin, for Rose Harvey, Glenn and Carol Cayley, Larry McKeon, Patricia Striley, and Chris Wright. We are praying for Karen Friga as she recovers from knee surgery. She's doing quite well, she says. Also, Sandy Watts, who's home recovering from a mild stroke and doing very well. There's a prayer request from Wisconsin for Janie and Aline. We are in prayer for the families of those lost in a terrible explosion in Beirut. There's an incredible video out there. I don't know if you've seen it. It's been circulating the internet this week of a a woman who was about to, was heading into the delivery room when the blast came in Beirut. And everything, as you might imagine, uh, went crazy. All the, all the glass bottles and windows shattered. And there she is in the delivery room. And the baby was born safe and healthy. It's another story of a nurse who grabbed three newborns in the newborn care unit and shielded them with her. She woke up to realize she had three babies in her arms that she had shielded from the blast, and they all survived. Also for families of those whose lives were lost in a plane crash in India. It seems like our news is all full of pandemic and politics, but things continue to happen all around the world for which we need prayer and strength and courage for folks. We celebrate this week as well. We celebrate where God is working in our lives. We celebrate Julie Taylor's birthday on Tuesday. She doesn't know I was going to mention that, but happy birthday, Julie. What else is coming? Uh, we lift up prayers for Lucy, who's struggling with heart problems. Prayers for Matthew, who uh, hit a deer while recovering from pneumonia and totaled his car. Oh, my goodness. Uh, he just got home from the hospital. Yeah. And so Annie asks, she's, she gives thanks for the outpouring of love for her and the new baby. Um, Maggie asks for prayer for her sister-in-law and her family. Uh, her father's getting a bone, the, the woman's father is getting a bone marrow transplant. Um, in Karen's healing, she's a week ahead in her physical therapy, which is very exciting, despite taking a small tumble. Um, and so Annie keeps talking about Miles' birth and how how grateful she is for the ability to catch up on sleep during naps. Um, Marianne's grandnephew is still in the NICU but was born, so that's exciting. Um, prayers for those who are opening schools. Um, Libby's daughter, Wendy, is opening a school for special needs children. And through the storms on the East Coast, I know that my Drew University, where I'm taking classes, they lost power. And we were in the middle of classes, and professors lost power, and and that kind of thing. Um, and in the midst of moves, um, there was someone who moves in the middle of this, but no symptoms after having to quarantine for 14 days. And 
in the midst of travel and all these worries. There are a lot of prayers going up this week. Yes. I've been in prayer this week, particularly for colleagues who um, transitioned into new churches on July, July 1st. Oh, yeah. Um, and haven't met their congregations yet, except virtually. And the struggles that come with that. It's hard enough starting over at a new church in our Methodist system, but um, to do it without having a congregation there um, is really hard. So we are in prayer for all these persons and more. Will you join with me in centering yourself and opening yourself to the presence of God as we pray together? Let the silence open your heart and relax your mind. Holy One, in the midst of storms and tribulation and trial and turbulence, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of pain, your promise is to be with us. Beginning and end, first and last, to be with us through it all. Sometimes it is very hard to trust that because we panic or we let fear write the script for our minds and our hearts. We let fear take over and we begin to live in it and we live in it so fully that we forget to recognize it for what it is. Holy One, clear our eyes, clear our hearts, clear our ears, clear our spirits to see you at the center of it all. Beyond the wind and the waves and the thunder and the lightning, beyond the gloom and the shadow, beyond whatever particular pain we're walking through right now, help us to see you. Calm the fear, banish the doubt. Still our troubled spirits. That we may once again see with fresh eyes who you are and where you are. We forget that fear is a liar. It tells us all sorts of things about you and about each other and about ourselves. But you are a God of compassion and peace and strength and courage. Trusting in you does not mean that bad things won't happen, though we wish it could be that way. Trusting in you means that when bad things happen, we can be assured that you will not leave us, you will not let us go. That you love us with a love fierce enough to conquer fear and deep enough to withstand every storm. Help us believe it to be true to the very depth of our being. 
into all those places where fear has made a home in us. We ask that you come and open the windows and the doors and banish it. We have prayed this morning already for so many. We've mentioned names and situations. But there are so many more we keep in our hearts. We carry with us every moment of every day, and we worry, and we hope, and we pray for them. And so in this moment of community, as odd as community looks these days, as we pray in community together, we lift those names, those persons, those situations to you as we speak them out loud wherever we are. You know each need, you know each name, you know each story, you know each hope. Fill each one with your grace to overflowing. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who stills the storms and calls us out of our panic. We ask it in his name as we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've had a couple more things come across on the live stream. Lots and lots of people have loved the bells today. That is just rolling through the live stream throughout. Also, Ayana, 
Ayana's turning 11 tomorrow, so another birthday to celebrate this week. Happy birthday, Ayana. One of the really fancy things that we get to do, since we are both live stream and live, is I get to post pictures of bell players on our Facebook page to share, um, saying we are grateful. So if you all look at the Facebook page after that, I did ask people to say, since we are so grateful for bells, and we are so grateful for um, being in worship with everyone, I asked people to say what they are grateful for. So after the service, not now, <laughs> just like I did, because you should do what I say and not what I do, go check out the Facebook page, and we'll share a little bit about that. Um, I do have permission to share photos of the family. So, Speaking of the beautiful way this service is structured and the way that we are able to communicate and connect in new ways, we come to a time when we give back to support those kinds of ministries. We give we give to the life of the church so that we may continue to connect as far as St. Petersburg, the United Kingdom, New Hampshire, Wisconsin. It just keeps going. The word of God and the people of God know no walls. And the best way to continue to support that growth and that, that spread and the movement of the Holy Spirit is to give. And so there are many different ways that you can give. If you decide you would like to mail a check, if you don't know what checks are anymore, that's a thing, and you decide you want to give online, you know, with your debit card or credit card, you can certainly do that. Um, I'll have Maggie or Tyler post the link where you can give. There is an app called Give Plus where you can give as well. You can call Maureen at the church office and see what your other options are. I just believe... And I know that you all believe in this ministry that continues to grow. And I am so thankful for the generosity of this congregation to make it so that staff continue to serve. Staff across all different job descriptions. I can't tell you the amount of time that Paul has been able to spend to make our custodian, to be able to make this space as safe as it is for people who have to work in the office, for us who have to come into the pews who come into the pews to decide to be with each other. This place is as safe as it possibly can be. And so thank you for your generosity, and I encourage you to keep giving, to share in that vision of a Holy Spirit that knows no walls. And so as you give, whether you are doing it now on your phone or you do it after church or you do it during the week, or you have set up auto-giving, because that's cool too, I would like to pray a prayer of blessing over the offering. Almighty God, we are so thankful to be able to be present with you in worship today, in worship without walls that is not only housed in a building, but that is housed in our hearts. May we continue to give with those grateful hearts, and we ask that you bless these offerings to continue to do your work in the world as shepherd supper numbers rise, as the need continues to rise, may we be able to rise to the occasion. Amen. Lots of things going on at Central. Knud, how many, how many at shepherd supper this week? I forgot that number. One, four, six? One, one two, two, six. six. 126 people came to shepherd supper for meals this week. That number has been well over 100 for the last few weeks. And so we are grateful for the, the ways you are supporting that ministry and the ways that folks come week after week to cook and to help hand meals to folks who are hungry and need it. If you are um, finding this worship to be fruitful as you watch on YouTube, I invite you, please share the link Put it out on your social media. Send it to your friends. This is an easy, painless way, um, non-awkward way to share your church with friends and family um, and help them connect with a faith community. Watch the website and your email for updates and information. You can get on our email list if you're not on it already by calling the office. And also um, 
Laurel mentioned Facebook, so if you are on Facebook, friend us and watch for updates and events there. Our book study is continuing on Zoom via Zoom tomorrow night at 7.30. If you haven't been there yet, you, still, you can join in any week. It's not a closed group, and uh, we really would love to have you. We're working through Sarah Bessie's Out of Sorts for the next couple of weeks, um, through the 24th, I think. And then we're beginning Richard Rohr's The Universal Christ. So if you want to come in on the next book, you can. Richard Rohr's The Universal Christ. Our soul care offerings are continuing at 10 a.m. days. And that is a time to come via Zoom and connect with other people in a meaningful and deep way. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Anyone and everyone is welcome um, to join Soul Care at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. We do as we gather and we check in with each other and we pray together and we maybe do a devotional. Uh, the link is sent out every week on how to find us, the password, the entry URL that you need. That's all on the weekly email. So if you don't receive that, it's right on the front page of the website where you can sign up to receive emails. And we'll make sure you get that so you can connect on Wednesday. We've come to the end of this time together. We're a little early this week. We're less than an hour. I'll get it back another week. How about that? It has been good to worship together, to listen for God's voice, to be able to pray with each other and for each other. That is the best of what community does. As you go into this week and into this world, may the God who stills the storms Come into your life, restore your spirit, and send you out in peace. Go in that peace. Amen.